Well, good afternoon to those Zooming on the East Coast time and good morning to all others joining us for this, after, for this exciting webinar. My name is Brent Fuel and I'm with Conserve America and I'm delighted to be moderating today's webinar on the Great American Outdoors Act. Uh, Conserve America is pleased to be co-hosting today's webinar along with a number of other great organizations, EarthX, the National Wildlife Federation, uh, the Property and Environmental Research Center, also known as PERC, and the Teddy Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. But before we jump into the program, I want to just say a quick word about Conserve America for those who don't know about us. Our organization has been around for nearly three decades, and in the last year, we have made a renewed effort to convene programs like this and help lead on important policy issues affecting the environment. We are a right of center group that seeks to promote pragmatic solutions to our nation's energy, environmental, and conservation challenges, advocating for market-based solutions and meaningful and lasting regulatory reform. I'm, I'm pleased to announce we have three great panelists lined up for today's discussion. Many of you know them. Uh, Colin O'Meara, president of NWF, Brian Yablonski of uh, Perks CEO, and Christy Plummer, chief conservation officer for TRCP. I've had the pleasure of working with each of them for years, and I consider each a friend and a prominent voice and important leader in the world of environmental and conservation policy and we are extremely grateful for their time and perspectives today. Each has agreed to offer opening thoughts on the act and provide more background on their respective organizations. We are also honored and delighted to have two special guests today, Senators Joe Manchin and Corey Gardner, who are co-sponsors of the act and champions of conservation in the Senate. Uh, before I turn to Colin to introduce Senator Manchin, I should mention that Senator Gardner uh, will be joining us midway through today's webinar and once he joins, we'll hit the pause button and Colin will introduce the good Senator who will offer his own thoughts on this historic opportunity. Uh, so Colin, I turn the floor over to you. And this is, a, this is an incredibly special treat. Um, one, look, one of the most, most incredible conservationists um, and frankly, one of the best shots, one of the best sportsmen in the entire US Congress is our guest today, Senator Joe Manchin. Um, a good friend from West Virginia, he has been Secretary of State, he has been Governor, he has been an amazing Senator um, calling for conservation to be a big, a big deal and make it a priority. And obviously, if you spent time in his great state, you know why, right? It's, it's wild and wonderful from the, from the New River Gorge to the Gulch up to, to New Canaan, um, amazing places um, across West Virginia. We could not be more honored that he is leading the charge with Senator Cory Gardner to pass the Great American Outdoors Act. Senator? Colin, thank you so much. And, and let me just thank all of you for having me today. And uh, we're coming down the home stretch right now and we've got all hanged together here. So we're trying to count the votes and we're gonna be talking again to the caucus that we put together, a bipartisan caucus of trying to make sure and, and we're whipping the votes now, making sure that we have the 60 plus that we need. We're looking for 65 uh, and uh, we're working very hard. Uh, you know, since, uh, this happened uh, three months uh, since the Great American Outdoors Act has been introduced. Uh, we've seen over 105,000 deaths uh, in the United States and over 40 million unemployment claims since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've never experienced anything in our lifetime like this. Uh, we're still very much in the midst of both a health and economic crisis. I've told everyone that started out as a health crisis, turned quickly into an economic crisis, and it's gonna have more challenges as we go forward. The new reality only brings into sharper focus why it is so important uh, for us to en en enact the Great American Outdoors Act, which we'll begin considering in the Senate later this week. And hopefully by next week, we'll be moving very rapidly through that. There's not a piece of legislation that I know that would do more to kickstart the economy uh, than the Great American Outdoors Act. Uh, we have this opportunity and we can't waste it. Uh, it provides permanent mandatory funding for land and water conservation uh, for $900 million annually, which is, I think, in the last 50 years or 55 years, only twice that's happened. It's been full funding, as I understood, and that's a great challenge we have. Uh, last year, the Senate passed the public lands package by an overwhelming vote of 92 to 8. Uh, 8 that included permanent authorization uh, uh, for the LWCF, uh, and to think within a short period of time, we're able to get full authorization and get full funding uh, is, is an unbelievable uh, task that I never thought would happen as quickly as it did, but we knew that once we got authorization, we had to start immediately for the funding. If not, we would miss 
that momentum that we had. Um, the Great American Outdoor Act includes a mandatory funding bill, which I introduced, and I'm glad that Senator Gardner signed on as a lead Republican. He's been working it very hard, and he's been great to work with, and Corey and I have known each other for quite some time. We have strong bipartisan support, as you know, with the majority of the Senate co-sponsoring the bill, along with a uh, strong bipartisan vote coming out of the committee. Uh, we need to secure the uh, funding because since LWCS established over 50 years ago, $22 billion, $22 billion has been deposited into the LWCF, but we're never uh, appropriated for LWCF purposes. So it was like a black hole or a dark hole or a deep hole that it's gone into and is never be seen again. Uh, so as we've, uh, with LWCF, we've been able to do great things with the funds that have been appropriated, which in recent years have averaged about half of the authorized funding level and the 450 million dollar level, and in previous years even less than that. Uh, just imagine how much good we're going to be able to do. Uh, the one challenge that we have right now in our caucus is Democrats. Uh, my friend Sheldon Whitehouse has been holding out and he's been fighting for the coastal, and, and I understand that, I respect that. And I told him I'd do everything I could to help. Uh, but we made a pact, all of us, uh, that worked this bill from day one, that, that we don't want any more amendments at all during this process. If we do, the floodgates would open up and I'm thinking it would inundate us. We're having uh, more of a challenge on our Republican colleagues right now coming on board. We had 13, uh, and we need a 13 we, uh, if we had all 47. If we get 45 votes, we, we know that we have 43 votes in the Democratic caucus. I'm hoping we'll get at least two more and who knows, maybe at the end of the day we'll get all 47. Uh, but with that, that means we still need 13 Republicans. Um, if we get 45 and we need 15 Republicans, and if we get 43, we need 17 Republicans. So we should be shooting to have at least 20 Republicans and we should be going for 65 votes. We really should. That should be our goal. And we're doing the whip count continuously talking about who's possibility. If you know anybody, and I've said this on the Republican side, I don't think you need to work the Re Democrat or you know, spend your time on the Democrats right now. We know where everyone is. We're talking to Tom Carper. Uh, we're talking to Brian Schatz. We're talking to Sheldon Whitehouse and Jack Reed. Whatever happens, Sheldon and Jack will stick together on this. And I respect that because they're both from the same state that's made that number one priority as far as coastal restoration and money for that. Um, and it's based off offshore, uh, his is based off offshore uh, wind. And I've told him, I says, after we pass this, I'll do everything I can in the committee, uh, being the ranking member and depending on what happens in the general election, where we might be. Uh, but with that being said, I, I've made my commitment to help Sheldon and everything, but he'll still have to make his play and go for a couple votes on the floor. So we'll see what happens. Uh, I don't need to tell you all about the importance of uh, uh, the LWCF. Uh, the new analysis from the Boston University also tells us that every $1 million invested in LWCF could support between 16.8 and 30.8 jobs. So let's say 17 to 31 jobs. At full funding of $900 million, that equates to 15 to 28,000 jobs. So if you want to jumpstart the economy, we know it'll work. That's, that's where you start. So we've used that, and I think everyone has received that and understands it means something in every state, more jobs. Uh, it's an important step. Uh, it's something that we have uh, once in a lifetime uh, chance to. And uh, I, 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 I think we're going to, I really feel good about it. And I think we have the right momentum at the right time. The deferred maintenance funding on the, uh, on the parks is something that uh, Lamar Alexander has been uh, very passionate about. <clears throat> but he's been very helpful on the LWCF also. They know it's imp imperative for them, for Portman uh, and Alexander and some of the leaders on the Republican, Corey and all of them, they have got to recruit more Republicans and understand what it means. Um, Lisa Murkowski is my counterpart in energy and natural resource, as you know. Lisa's been wonderful to work with. She has not supported the full funding of LWCF because of her commitment to, to the Appropriations Committee. I understand that. I'm on appropriations also, but she has never, ever stood in and try to block something. She's let it go through the process, and I can't thank her enough for that. Uh, but with that, we have our work cut out for us. Uh, uh, we got Go Mesa, we got people who want, and if, and if you open up that Pandora's box, everything happens. So we're very careful, and we don't, you know, it's not that we're posing 
any of that. We're just opposing it on this piece of legislation. That's what they have to understand. And we try to explain to them what we're dealing with here. So everyone I understand right now is holding their ground. Uh, no one uh, has broken from that. We've all committed that. And, and I have a piece of legislation which basically changes the New River Gorge into the New River Gorge National Park. Mm -hmm. It's non-controversial with everybody, but this would be a perfect place to put it. But if I did that, then, then I couldn't expect anyone else not to have their own private and personal piece of legislation they wanted to. So I've had to tell our people in West Virginia, this was not the vehicle for that either. So it's one of those things where you've just got to make sure that we, we hold the line and we do it and keep it as clean as possible. I got to make sure that my Democrat caucus doesn't go crazy on me saying, oh, wait a minute, we always wanted amendments <laughs> on bills. Well, we've had, this, this bill has been worked through committee. This bill has worked extensively through committee. So it's not like it's just coming to the floor of the hotline. So that, I'll, uh, I'll address that today in the caucus at one o'clock. So let me just say to, to all of you again, I, I feel very good. I, I know right now we have 59 co-sponsors. I feel comfortable with 59. 59 doesn't pass. That's one short. So that's what that's our work cut out for us between now and when it hits the floor. So anything you all can do, it's been unbelievable the amount of people that come together. What we have 800 uh, different organizations that are supporting us. It's uh, unheard of. And I guarantee you, every one of those organizations, whether it's the left of the party of the Democrats or the right of the party of the Republicans, you all have interacted with every one of them. And now's the time to to tell them to step up. We need them. This, this time might never pass again, gentlemen and ladies, on this. And that, that concerns me that we have this golden opportunity, that window open. Let's go through it. Okay. Any questions well, at all? You. Anything you might? Well, thank answer? you, Senator. And, and what I can promise you is we at Conserve America will we'll do what we can to help deliver your Republican uh, counterparts to, to support this important piece of legislation. So, we appreciate you joining us today and for your continued leadership on the on these important matters. Um, you know, at a time when the norm in Washington, D.C. is partisan gridlock, it's refreshing and actually heart heartwarming to witness such bipartisan collaboration. So thank you. It, it, it really has. Let me tell you one thing. It truly has been a bipartisan effort. It really has been. And even some of our Republican friends who might not have committed. I think we have five or ten on the cusp, but a, a, a few encouragements from you all would be very helpful. Corey should be able to line that up, the ones he knows I can give it. After Corey makes his presentation to you, I'm happy to follow up on the names I think that are gettable, and maybe you all should kind of hone in on them. That's great. Brian, Colin, and Christy, yeah. any any thoughts or comments? For this hey, this is Colin. Yeah, hey, Colin. hey, Senator, this is Colin. Um, hey, one Colin. thing that, hey, sir. Um, one thing that I want all the viewers to know, that there was a point in time that this bill just included maintenance for the Park Service. And, and the senator worked with myself and Jeff Crane, who runs the Congressional Sportsman Foundation, a whole bunch of sportsman groups to make sure that the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management, the National Wildlife Refuges, and, and, and Indian schools were included in the bill. And now and all of a sudden we have a bill that supports recreational access for all kinds of, all kinds of activities, including hunting and fishing. TRCP was in the middle of that too. Um, a great effort. So just this is the bill that everyone should support whether you like going hunting and fishing or you want to just go camping and hiking or anything in between. Um, this is a home run and we got to let all the senators know that. Well, the thing we had to call the interesting is behind the scenes, we had uh, a lot of members who really supported the uh, uh, restore our parks and might not have been uh, supporters of LWCF. And uh, the restore our parks people thought that they had a stronger piece of legislation. They wanted theirs to go clean. And I said, nah, we're, gonna, we're either going to, we're, <laughs> This is where we're hanging together or hang separately. We're not going separate ways on this one. That was the reason we merged both bills. It was important to play off of the strengths of both of both pieces of legislation, which really plays into if you're if you're a person who basically under understands the uh, uh, the, the quality of life that, this, uh, that nature gives us basically, and the good Lord's presented us, but also the economic opportunities that it presents also. That it's a win-win. It was it was it was just a natural for these two to go together, and that's what's held together so far. And that's why I'm telling you, we have people that basically might not be strong with uh, with restore our parks, but have been always very favorable. LWCF, my Republican counterparts that aren't on it, but are 
or, or wavering there that I think a, a little bit of a push from y'all's end might be very helpful. See if Corey will identify those for you. And then if not, then I'll get you the names. <laughs> very good. Senator, thank you. If, thank you. Just really quickly, it's Christy Plummer with TRCP, and thank you Hi, for Christy. your leadership on this. Um, it's it's really tremendous. You know, it in terms of those of us who are in DC and and looking for opportunities to retreat and find well-being and and you know peace of mind out in the in in your state. Um, you know, it, it's where a lot of us are spending time hiking and fishing and hunting right now. And I know, you know, your work and all of those tremendous public lands we have um, to share with you and your constituents in West Virginia are really important right now. And, and LWCF is a, a key part of, of the protections for Dolly Sods and the Lower Galley River and, and Canaan Valley and a lot of your special places in the state. So just a, a huge thank you from sportsmen and women that are out there recreating in West Virginia right now. Well, Chrissy, I've been able to sneak away to Canaan. We have a little place in Canaan, which I think is a piece of heaven. And this, it just does something. It's a pretty special place, as you know, if you've visited up there. But uh, I think we all need to recharge our batteries every now and then. There's no better way to do it than go out and look at the God-given uh, uh, beauty that we have. It's just unbelievable. And it really does. It just gives you peace of mind. I can walk through the tundra in Canaan and think I'm in Canada or think I'm in the bogs. That's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. And the fishing's been... Fishing's been pretty good too. A lot more fishermen now. They got more time to fish. I got to be able. I got to have social distancing and fishing now. But I still enjoy it. But thank you all. It's been, it's been wonderful. And uh, Brent, uh, I appreciate uh, you moderating this, but just keeping us all together here. Uh, we got two weeks, guys. Okay? Two weeks. We should be through this thing in a couple weeks. I really believe that. Well. Yep. Well, thank you, Senator. Appreciate again your your okay. strong leadership on these we'll issues. Keep in touch. Okay. I'm going to have to go now. Thank we you. Got Okay. Yeah, talk is coming up. I got to convince them that we're on the same page. Here. I'm, I'm, my goal is to get all 47. That means I really got to do a heavy lift on, on <laughs> Phil and, and Jack Reed. They're great uh, friends and great people. And they, they're with us. They just have, this is the only, they've got to make their point. And somehow I've got to give them some comfort. There's a way that we can help them. Just not on this bill. Yeah, we've got the whole Delaware mafia working on TC right now. So Good, okay. <laughs> we're, we're on it. <laughs> okay. Hey, thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks good, Senator. Uh, yep. Well, that was fantastic hearing from the Senator. So, uh, Colin, why don't we uh, kick things off with you and, and, you know, you can tell us a little bit more about uh, your organization, kind of your respective perspective on, on this act, and then we'll go to uh, uh, Brian and Christy. Great. No, thank you, Brendan. Thank you all for, for joining today. Um, the National Wildlife Federation um, is America's, America's largest wildlife conservation organization. We have 6 million members. We, we're actually a federation. We have affiliates in all 50 states um, and we kind of run the gamut. We work on a lot of issues that are, are dear, and, dear and near to the heart of um, sportsmen and women across the country, but we also work on, on issues in frontline communities and environmental justice concerns. And so we really try to bring people together to do big things for conservation. The, um, you know, the moment we have in front of us is incredibly important. And I just, I hope everyone kind of acknowledge recognizes how rare these moments are, but also at the same time, the, these rare moments over the last few years have often been conservation. Um, you know, this coalition that came together for this bill that we're talking about today also helped push a historic public lands package, also helped fix the fire funding crisis in this country. Um, it's also done big things for ecological restoration of waterways um, and good conservation programs in the farm bill. And so, you know, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, some have kind of retreated back to their partisan corners, but at the end of the day, a lot of folks are trying to find common ground. And I think, you know, if history is any guide, that that we can put people back to work through conservation. The the pandemic is forcing a number of folks to really struggle right now, um, trying to figure out unemployment. Almost 40 million people are unemployed. Of that, 7.7 .7 million young Americans under 30. Um, and one of the things that Senator Manchin mentioned is that we know that conservation is a way to put a lot of people to work very quickly. And it's, it's one of the most cost-effective cost ways to do so because most of, the, most of the work, most of the money goes into labor as opposed to materials and equipment. And so, you know, it's a way, as the Senator said, you know, between, you know, 20 and 30 jobs per million dollars of, of work. And so whether that's, you know, restoring our, our parks and our maintenance backlog um, and the work that we're talking about for all of our public lands or LWCF and unlocking parcels that have incredible opportunity for, 
for recreation, um, there are meaningful opportunities that all of us can engage right now. And look, this was good policy before the pandemic. It's absolutely essential policy right now. So the Great Americans Outdoors Act, with, with unemployment hitting record highs, and so many workers, this is absolutely essential to our economic recovery. It's going to put millions of Americans, it's going to put hundreds of thousands of Americans back to work. It's going to spur the outdoor recreation economy, which is one of the strongest parts of our economy. But obviously, folks aren't traveling right now. And so it's incredibly important to get these industries moving again. It's going to help recover wildlife and help conserve our, our public lands for future generations. And look, and I think one thing that, as Christy just mentioned, mentioned I mean, one thing that's become really obvious during this pandemic is that Americans love to get outdoors to exercise. You know, they love to connect with nature, they love to seek solace. Um, and, and, you know, LWCF and the Recreation Project gets support to play a key role in our physical, emotional, economic recovery. Now, at the same time, there's a lot of Americans that don't have access to nature. And, you know, in, in terms of the ability to kind of walk around the corner and have some kind of open space and ideally some, you know, native habitat, um, this is the program that brings nature close to home. This is the opportunity we have to make sure that regardless of your zip code, regardless of the color of your skin, that you can enjoy amazing outdoor, outdoor recreational opportunities. One of the reasons we don't have more of those opportunities today is because the, the, the program's been rated to the tune of $22 billion over the past several decades. Like every single part of the country, from the grasslands to forests to coastal habitats, has a backlog of projects, has parcels that if you conserve them and protected them, we could increase access for. Um, and so there's so many opportunities that this package puts together. And so, look, I, I know the news is rough, right? I mean, we see there's, there's all kinds of challenges on the landscape. The depths of the economic impacts, the impacts facing um, different parts of the community are massive right now. We have to get folks working again. And one of the best ways that we've proven over and over again is through conservation. It's bipartisan. It helps every region of the country. It's going to help in urban communities. It's going to help in rural communities. We're going to be able to put a lot of folks of color to work, a lot of, a lot of indigenous youth to work. We're going to have folks working in, in, in rural communities. I mean, we've talked a lot about how we need to recreate a 21st century civilian conservation corps. What better down payment to start in that process than restoring our parks, which are America's greatest idea, and then increasing access to recreation, not just at the federal level, but at the state level and local level as well. This is an absolute home run. And I'm so proud to be with my good colleagues to help all of, hopefully inspire all of you to get really involved over the next few weeks to make sure this is a huge bipartisan victory. And frankly, one of the most important conservation wins in decades. Absolutely, thank you, Colin. And Brian, um, Colin talked, uh, mentioned briefly the backlog, the deferred maintenance backlog. How did, how did it get to be $20 billion? Well, good question. Let me, uh, well, let me first thank Conserve America, Brent and Jeff for hosting this. And it's great to be uh, on the panel with some friends and colleagues, fellow conservationists that I've known for years, uh, all good people. Um, PERC, you know, is a 40 year old uh, market based conservation research center that was founded by some outdoor loving economists uh, that were looking at issues like the deferred maintenance uh, backlog many decades ago. We're actually based uh, not far from Yellowstone National Park. Uh, so we're really proud to live in the shadows of the world's first national park out here in uh, Bozeman, Montana. And uh, we tend to focus on property rights and markets to, to address environmental problems. Um, you know, to your question, Brent, like we really believe that conservation at its core is about taking care of what you already own. And that starts with good management of our public lands. It starts with being good stewards of your public lands. Uh, and that brings the focus uh, to the maintenance backlog that we're talking about here. Uh, we actually, at PERC, we actually believe coverage of the Great American Outdoors Act has been, been a little upside down. Uh, there's been so much focus on LWCF. And while there are many good conservation projects out there, potentially under LWCF, we don't necessarily need more public land, but we definitely need to fix and care for the land that we own right now. That is a that should be a first solemn responsibility uh, of, as conservationists. Um, PERC, you know, going back to the mid 1990s, uh, PERC is, PERC's research has elevated the need to address the National Parks maintenance backlog. Way back in uh, way back in 1997, we released a report called "Back to the Future to Save Our Parks." Uh, Holly Fretwell, one of our research fellows who's still with us, was a was a co-author of that. Uh, and it was highlighting the deferred maintenance project at that time, which was $5.3 billion for the national parks. Today, the maintenance backlog is $12 billion. So it hasn't gotten any better over, uh, over a generation of time. And uh, in 2016, we issued another report called Breaking the Backlog, 
ideas to address uh, the National Park Deferred Maintenance problem. More recently, uh, we've been called to testify in Congress uh, on the maintenance backlog on our public lands. Uh, we've testified five times over the last four years, and we were actually called to testify at the very first Senate hearing on the Restore Our Parks Act, which eventually got merged into the Great American Outdoors Act. So, um, so we're excited to see this uh, to see this legislation uh, come forward. Um, you know, I, I, to your to your specific question, Brent, about how we got here, uh, really, um, you know, deferred maintenance. And I, part of the part of the webinar here is to sort of educate folks and talk to folks about what's in the legislation, politics aside and vote counts aside. And, that's something I try not to get involved in, but actually to let folks know what, what is in here. Uh, and there's this reference to deferred maintenance. Folks might not know what deferred maintenance is. Uh, deferred maintenance is really cyclic or annual maintenance that's not addressed uh, when it's supposed to be and it rolls into deferred maintenance and it keeps getting rolled. And that accumulated maintenance for our national parks, the Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Land Management combined is $20 billion. That's how much maintenance we've let go by. Uh, to put that into context, the National Parks backlog that I mentioned that was $12 billion of maintenance is four times the size of the National Parks annual budget. I mean, think of your family budget and your maintenance needs. And imagine if what you needed to do around the house was four times uh, the amount that your family brings in each year as, a, as salary and wages. I mean, that's a daunting number. Um, so how we really got here Three ways. One, um, you know, there was a failure of Congress to make maintenance a priority. Uh, and that's, that's what literally has had some of this rolling. And, and admittedly, fixing a leaky water pipe, you know, in a wastewater system in Yellowstone National Park is not as sexy as creating a new National Park Visitor Center. So politics has had something to do with it. Um, secondly, there's been something called the thinning, a uh, former National Parks director called it the thinning of the blood. Uh, and essentially what that meant is acquisition of lands has been outpacing our maintenance budget. So in 2017, there was a, a report done by the Congressional Research Service that showed in the previous 10 years that the National Park's construction budget was falling at an inflation adjusted annual rate of 4.3%. During those same 10 year period of time, time though, we were adding 23 new National Parks units and adding 432,000 acres. So more parks, but less money to care for them has sort of knocked that ratio out of whack. And then finally, uh, and it's a good thing, but there's been a surge in national parks visitors. Uh, if you look at a chart of the historic visitation of the parks, going back to the early 1900s, you'd see this climb that goes up into the mid 1980s. And in the mid 1980s, we were about at like 22, uh, 287 million visits. So the climate had gone up. And then in, in the mid-1980s, it really flattens out until the 2000s. Um, never got past that 287 million number. But then all of a sudden in 2014, it shot up again. I call it the visitation surge. And in just three years, we went from 287 million to 330 million. That was a 16% wow. increase over five years. That's almost 60 million additional visitors per year to our national parks. Uh, 28 parks set records last year in terms of visitation. So that's just more wear and tear on trails, boardwalks, campgrounds, wastewater systems. So this is a, to us, this is the key issue uh, in this bill. And that's why we're so passionate about it. Well, thank you, Brian. And for those um, who have not uh, visited Perk, uh, if you get the chance to go out and visit Yellowstone, stop by uh, Perk and say hello to the great team there. They've got uh, an awesome team who are doing amazing things. So. Speaking of amazing things, um, Christy, TRCP has been an absolutely critical uh, player in, in bringing this legislation to the floor. So thank you again for your leadership and that of TRCP members. So um, what's, what's your perspective on, on this piece of legislation? Thanks, Brent. And thanks again to Conserve America, as others have mentioned. And for those of you who don't know who TRCP is, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, we're Partnership organization focused on ensuring all Americans have access to quality places to hunt and fish. And so access and, and call that, that concept of quality access is really important to us. In thinking about some of my, my comments for, for today, you know, I, I, you really have to go back to, to how all of this came to be in the United States that these, 
these founding members of the conservation community, both men and women who were passionate about conservation, really saw this need for setting aside public lands, whether it was National Wildlife Refuges, uh, Forest Service, um, Forest System lands, um, eventually BLM lands, Park Service lands. You know, so the Theodore Roosevelt's, um, our namesake, um, John Muir's, Aldo Leopold's, those types of members who really came together to say that there is this need for setting aside public lands that all Americans can enjoy. And, you know, that vision is ultimately what came to formulate a lot of our, our conservation laws. Um, and, and eventually this concept of land and water conservation fund that there was this funding source need in order to continue to realize that vision and make sure that we weren't like you know, what was happening over in Europe where the private landowners were the ones where you could go and hunt and fish. And if you weren't a private landowner, you didn't have access to hunting and fishing, didn't have access to hike in places, didn't have access to kayak or canoe. And so really this vision that started back in the early 1900s and then ushered forward Land and Water Conservation Fund and this, this funding source um, from oil and gas revenues from offshore was, was really this amazing continuation of this vision that, that set up an unparalleled system of conservation in this country and something we should be really proud of. And, you know, again, as I mentioned to the Senator, I, I think, you know, you just can't take it for granted what we have now. This, this system of, you know, even what LWCF has provided through the state side portions of funding for our state parks, our counties, our municipalities, our greenways, a lot of that has, has come from Land and Water Conservation Fund from the state side portions of the funding. And, you know, it, it's just, it, it's a tremendous opportunity. Um, you know, I think access, again, for my organization is really important. We've seen some important um, shifts made to the program, to the Land and Water Conservation Fund program in recent years, where there is some specific portions of funding set aside for recreational access. We then have, other programs that have been nested under LWCS, like the Forest Legacy Program, which has been used to set aside state um, wildlife management areas or expand upon state wildlife management areas. So again, these, these amazing access opportunities. We've done a lot of work with a GPS um, organization, GPS business called Onyx, where we've really looked to identify of these tremendous networks of public lands, specifically in the West is where our focus has initially been. Um, there are a lot of landlocked public lands out there, uh, Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service lands, where hunters and anglers, hikers, you know, photographers can't get in to access what, what is owned by all of Americans. So we've done some research with Onyx, shown that 9.5 million acres of federal public lands in the West are landlocked. That means they're surrounded by private land and you can't get into them. So we have the Land and Water Conservation Fund as an opportunity to start to unlock some of that access. And we're beginning to do some work in the East um, and finding landlocked public lands exist in the East as well. So, you know, for sportsmen and women in my organization and all of the partners we represent, NWF, PERC are two of them. We've got six, 58 others, total of 60 partners on our policy council. LWCF is, is really the key to unlocking access, ensuring access for all Americans. So it's, it's a tremendous program and, and one that we've done a lot of work on with the partners on the phone and others, and something we're really excited to see this close toward the finish line. Great, thank you, Christy. And I see uh, Senator Gardner is joining us as we speak. So uh, before, while well, the Senator, uh, uh, joins us here. Just a quick question. You know, Brian, you, you raised a really good point and, and Senator Manchin alluded to it. There's, there are uh, a number of Republicans, conservatives who have obviously had some angst about the Land and Water Conservation Fund and the, the fact that LWCF and we have so many public lands, wonderful, beautiful, you know, uh, public lands that, that we all care for and cherish. Uh, but that have not been maintained. And, and you raised uh, some good points of, about, um, you know, about the need to take care of, of the lands that we have rather than, than, uh, than, than purchasing and acquiring more lands. You know, what, what would you say to, to those uh, members who are on the, on the fence? Obviously we have two acts, two pieces of legislation here, you know, LWCF and, 
and the, and 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 uh, the Great Outdoors, uh, Great American Outdoors Act. What what would you say to to them to 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 you know get them across the finish line uh, on this piece of le legislation? Well, I mean, look, I. I as I look at the legislation, um, you know, Perk has testified on LWCF and there are things that we would have loved to have seen going forward with that program, perhaps more flexibility uh, for how that funding is spent because it's 40% is, is a hard lock-in for acquisition. And um, if you talk to our public land managers like the superintendent of Yellowstone, um, there might be a situation where they would want acquisition, but there might be a situation that the conservation priority uh, might be a maintenance or management issue, you know, a forest mm -hmm. uh, management, having to actively manage forest for wildfires, or, or like, look, in Yellowstone, there are 10 wastewater systems that are beyond their useful life, and mm. um, that's a $100 million cost, and that's a real conservation impact. If any of those wastewater systems break, you know, it jeopardizes the rivers and streams and the watersheds coming out of Yellowstone. Um, right. What I would say to folks who are looking at this act, though, I, I I think what it does that's really great is this creation of a legacy restoration fund. Um, and that's a dedicated trust fund that's just for deferred maintenance. It's the first time anything like this has been done for maintenance. So it's historic in that sense. And that's gonna be financed by unobligated revenues or excess dollars from energy development on federal lands and waters. Um, what, the, what the bill calls for is 1.9 billion over five years. So that's a total of up to about 9.5 billion uh, to address the backlog. That's pretty significant. That's like half, mm -hmm. half of the $20 billion backlog on our public lands. 70% uh, of that's going to go to the national parks. 15% will go to the uh, Forest Service. 5% to the Fish and Wildlife Service for all of us hunting and angling fans. 5% uh, to the Bureau of Land Management. 5% to the Bureau of Indian Education. Um, and, and no less than 65% of that has to go to non-transportation projects. So if everybody thinks, oh, it's just roads, it's not roads, it's trails, it's campgrounds, it's um, housing for employees, which is a real issue. Like in Yellowstone, mm -hmm. you're living in like condemned trailers and the superintendent here is doing an amazing job to, to get quality housing. Like we can't ask biologists to come and study wildlife and fish and put them into hovels, you know, while we're asking them to do, <laughs> do this public service. Uh, historic buildings, you know, so much a part of our park system um, will be covered by all that. And then, you know, we can talk later, but there's this really, for Republicans, you know, or for conservatives or for libertarians or market-based, we're market-based, so we're nonpartisan. Um, there's an endowment fund, an investment fund opportunity here that has been created by the bill sponsors that says you don't have to go out and spend the money in one slug right away. You can be thoughtful, spend it on the priority projects. That might not be ready to happen right away. You, you might have to go through a NEPA review process but to make sure we hit the right priority projects, um, there's an endowment or investment fund that can actually earn money for future uh, spending to address uh, some of these high priority maintenance projects. So. Great, thank you, Brian. And I see uh, the good Senator has, has joined us. Colin, uh, why don't you go off mute and, and uh, uh, introduce our special guest this afternoon. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Brent. It's, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce um, one of the leading conservation champions in the United States Senate. Um, for the past several years, you know, Cory Gardner has made conservation a top priority. And frankly, I, we can say, you know, with a very straight face that the, that the public lands package that came together uh, a year ago, January, um, would not have happened if it wasn't for him bringing people together. And obviously now we're on the precipice of another huge um, conservation win um, because of the relationship that he has both with Republicans as well as across the aisle and the work that he did with President Trump and the work he did with Leader McConnell um, to make the Great American Outdoors Act a priority. Um, as I said before, it was a great idea before the pandemic. Now it's a necessity to help get us out of the pandemic. And so it is my pleasure to introduce the, uh, the Senator from Colorado, Cory Gardner. Hey, thank you, Colin. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Brent. Uh, thanks to all of you for the opportunity to, to, to get this work that we have been working on for so many years and decades finally across the finish line. Uh, as we work toward that goal uh, next week. So thanks to all of you. I, I couldn't be more excited about what is about to be accomplished, uh, it, but it's certainly not an individual accomplishment. This has taken a lot of blood, sweat, and tears from people over the decades. Uh, it's taken a lot of blood, sweat, and tears from people on this call. Uh, we're still making those phone calls to members right now, making sure we're locking down more support, getting more people engaged, getting more people excited about it. Uh, and so thank you for being a part of this uh, 
absolute team effort for what is uh, the country's greatest idea, and that's the preservation of our public lands for future generations. Uh, and so uh, I just left the meeting uh, with Steve Daines and I and Senator McConnell talking about uh, what we expect this week, uh, how we're reaching out to members, what we're going to expect next week in terms of the floor activities and votes and uh, uh, the ideas to get this uh, bill done. Uh, and so, uh, you know, look, uh, you mentioned jobs and what we're facing right now. We, these are, you know, absolutely incredible unparalleled times in any of our lifetimes. You think about the first waves of the coronavirus and what it meant uh, to places like Western Colorado, where the ski season shut down months uh, early, where outfitters had reservations canceled, where hotels and restaurants emptied out. We know in Colorado that our outdoor economy, our recreation economy is $28 billion a year. And we know nationally it's responsible for over 5 million jobs. And to be able to put uh, $1.9 billion into the Restore Our Parks Act, to be able to fully fund Land and Water Conservation Fund, uh, it's going to create uh, well over 100,000 jobs just on the parks side alone. And if you're in Western Colorado and you lost your job and your restaurant's not open again, and maybe your outfitter that you work with is no longer in business, well, this is going to give people that opportunity to continue working in the great outdoors uh, and getting back on their feet economically as we restore uh, our, our greatest spaces and as we protect them for generations to come. So this really is a, a great idea. The latest study showed 110,000 jobs created by the uh, the parks provision of this bill, uh, well over, I think right around 15, 20,000 created by the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, you know, for every, I think for every million dollars that's been the Land and Water Conservation Fund, we're going to create around uh, 12 to 16 jobs, I think is the number that we just got back from Boston University. So uh, these are things that we will continue to, to highlight uh, as we reach out to our colleagues. And that's just the message for all of us on the call is to continue working with our colleagues and to make sure that they understand the importance of this, uh, whether you're you consider yourself in the hook and bullet crowd, whether you consider yourself in the, uh, the, the you know, hiking crowd, whether you consider yourself in the, uh, the, the, the ranch and grazing side, there's something for every single person in this bill. We have an area the size of Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado that is owned by the public, but the public cannot get to. Uh, this is part of the solution. Uh, this is going to create greater access, greater opportunities for hunters, anglers, fixing up blinds, boat docks, you name it. Uh, campsites for people to enjoy, the vault toilets that we have uh, in the areas across uh, uh, Colorado that need to be fixed uh, and uh, do a better job maintained uh, and the environmental benefits that go along with that. So thanks to all of you for your incredible support. Thanks for your work. Uh, we're, we're, this, is, this thing has momentum. Uh, we are days away from our first vote. Uh, some of us thought this might never happen, but thanks to everybody on this call, thanks to all of my colleagues and the great bipartisan support we've had, we're going to get a vote. We're going to get a bill, and we're going to be able to tell our children and grandchildren when the moment counted, we rose to the rose to the occasion, and made sure that that land is there for generations to come. So, uh, thank you very much to all of you for the incredible, incredible work you've done. And I'm happy to just turn it back over to uh, Colin, to Brent, to whoever's uh, whoever's in charge here. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Yeah, Open it up to Colin, Christy, or Brian for some some questions. And Christy, thank you, Christy. <laughs> Brian, thank you. Hey, Senator, this is Colin again. The, um, how, how, what, where can we best help? I mean, we just talked to Senator Manchin a few minutes ago. Obviously, there's a few targets left on that side. But I don't know if, you, if there's individuals or places we can you know, really, you know, I think we're, we're all, you know, we're at 59 right now with you know, the incredible leadership we got. We want to get to 60. You know, there's obviously the budget point of order we want to get through. Um, but how can we best help if we're going to mobilize, you know, millions of Americans to try to get this across the finish line? Absolutely. Look, we know where the co-sponsors are of the bill, and, and so that's great. But if you are in a state or have a relationship with a senator who is not a co-sponsor, start with them. Uh, if you're in Mississippi, start with uh, Cindy Hyde-Smith and Roger Wicker. Uh, let, let's talk to the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Richard Shelby, who, you know, maybe he doesn't like the uh, mandatory spending side of this thing because appropriators don't necessarily like that, but doggone it, to, uh, this is a legacy for him. Uh, to be a part of, uh, to be able mm -hmm. to have done the most significant conservation uh, effort, been a part of that uh, in decades. Um, you know, you've got uh, people like, uh, you know, Marsha Blackburn, who has been a great supporter of our battlefields. Let's make sure that they're comfortable with where we're at uh, on this. Uh, you know, people like Tim Scott, uh, who you got Lindsey Graham supporting it. Uh, you know, you've got others. Uh, you, in fact, I think the House bill is being carried by a South Carolina member of Congress. Those are things that we should highlight. Not that they're against it, not that they've said no, but let's just uh, let's just firm it up, lock it in, uh, and, uh, and and get ready to roll. That's great. Very helpful. 
Thank you, Senator, and uh, uh, grateful for your continued leadership on this. And we got to thank you for for convincing leadership to to bring this to the floor. So we know you had a lot to do with that. So so well, you know, I, I you. Just, well, and credit to Senator McConnell who had uh, you know had had not uh, been supportive of bringing this to the floor until right. uh, you know we spent a lot of time over the last many years working with him on him. And then to credit to all of you for bringing two bills together that had you know, the, the necessary support to get beyond any kind of a filibuster attempt by members, a bipartisan coalition. And when we're done with 2020 uh, and we look back, uh, you know, you'll see all of the work that's been done dealing with pandemics and dealing with the murder of George Floyd and rightfully so. But when it comes to those things that uh, were actually sort of originated uh, that, that weren't in response to uh, tragedy and heartache, uh, this is going to be something that will help heal America. And, you think about our public spaces. Uh, Enid Mills, the founder uh, of Rocky Mountain National Park, Enos Mills used to go out and talk about how uh, the our, our public spaces, our public lands gave us that room to think, uh, that room to enjoy, to recreate, to contemplate. And uh, I can think of no better time than now uh, for that need to, to be met uh, in this great country. Couldn't agree more. Thank you, Senator. You're welcome to stay with us, but we understand if you have to uh, sign off. Hey, I need to go lobby some of my, my colleagues now at <laughs> the, the caucus meeting and uh, make sure that we, the people that I mentioned to you, on the list. <laughs> Thanks. Get on with it. Thank Thanks. you. Great. Thanks, Senator. Thanks. Thanks, Senator. So turn it back to our panel. I, you know, one thing that really strikes me, and I threw this out to, to any of you, you know, obviously this, this piece of legislation is tied to to energy revenues, uh, there's a big push by many environmentalist groups to, to reduce um, uh, reduce dependency upon oil and, and carbon uh, carbon fuels. So how how does that work long term? Uh, it, this is obviously not going to be uh, a permanent fix for the, the maintenance cost of, of our public land. So so how's this going to work long term? As is is energy revenues continue to go down? Hey, Brent, I'll, I'll start and would love help from Colin and, and Brian. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I think we've been struggling with this for a long time, and, and especially as, as more and more of our organizations are really starting to dive into to thinking about long-term resilience and some of the climate issues. And, and um, you know, I, I think the key is diversification of the funding sources. Um, I, you know, I think that's one thing that's that's really brilliant about the approach for the trust fund for the National Parks and Public Land Legacy Restoration Fund, where you do have this recognition that we need to be looking at, at all revenues from energy development. Um, a, a number of our groups are also working on something called the Public Lands Renewable Energy uh, Development Act and Florida, um, where, you, where you do have this recognition that renewable energy is going to continue to grow and continue to impact our public lands. And, Similar to oil and gas development, you know, there, there needs to be an offset from that and, and an investment in, in long-term conservation from the impacts of renewable, which we, you know, we know wind, we know, we know solar does impact our public lands, um, you know, has impacts offshore as well. So, you know, I, I think, again, in my mind, the key really is diversification and, and looking more holistically to the future on, in terms of those revenue sources. Yeah, I, I, I'll jump in. I think Christy hit the nail on the head in terms of diverse revenue streams. Uh, we kind of need to bring everything to the table. Um, I mean, if you think about it, it's just not the Legacy Restoration Fund, but LWCF, you know, both are tied to energy revenues. And if you look at last year, uh, about $5.6 billion came in from offshore fossil fuel uh, development. Um, and that's covering the lion's share of these programs right now. About 410 million, only 410 million came in from wind uh, development. So there's a big spread there, and our researchers mm -hmm. are indicating uh, these programs would probably have to rely on um, energy development up to like 2050 um, before you can diversify. But one one thing that isn't talked about as much, and Christy mentioned uh, Floria, which is the Federal Lands uh, Recreation Enhancement Act, is the use of fees um, and how much parks can rely on user fees, you know, fees that are charged at the entry gate or fees that are charged for campgrounds or concessionaire fees that provide services. And as, as we see a surge on our public lands, not just national parks, but 
Forest Service lands, and more and more people are sort of behind this $887 billion outdoor recreation industry, um, you know, there is a big role for fees that could be played here. And so, you know, we think like the park superintendents, um, A, the the FLORIA Act enables uh, superintendents at the national parks and supervisors of Forest Service to actually keep 80% of the fees that they generate there inside the park. So it aligns the incentives for the, our public land managers to do the right thing if they can keep it rather than it just getting flushed back to Congress. So we think FLORIA should be reauthorized. That's up for reauthorization in 2020. We also think the superintendent should be able to set fees based on the market um, and have that flexibility. Like for example, Banff and Yellowstone National Parks, if you compare the two, Banff in Canada you know, charges $10 per person per day or $20 per family per day to go to, to Banff, which, which is a beautiful national park in Canada, has the same amount of visitors as Yellowstone. Yellowstone can only charge $35 per car and that's for seven days. So there's not really a market basis there um, in terms of, of getting that price right, but I think a superintendent has the incentive to get the price right. The other thing I would say, and this really is Christy and Colin, and I think we probably all agree on this, is that the North American wildlife model, uh, where hunters and anglers through licenses are actually paying for wildlife conservation. You know, there's this idea that if you're gonna impact wildlife, um, you should underwrite wildlife conservation. So for decades, um, hunters and anglers have been paying uh, license fees that go straight back to wildlife conservation. There is this huge surge of hikers and kayakers and mountain bikers and climbers mm -hmm. that could be tapped as users to help supplement or offset or match some of the funding that's coming from Congress. And, and you, know, you have these t-shirts out here that says, I'm a public land owner. Um, really be a public landowner. I mean, you're, you're a public land user and, and all those activities I just named have impacts on our public lands, just like hunting and angling have impacts on wildlife. And so there's a benefit there. You think people would want to step up and, and, um, and pay a little extra knowing that that revenue will go straight back to conservation. I think that's a source that we need to, to look at too. So those would be the three areas I would, I would focus on. Yeah, really, really good points, Brian. Any, any uh, response from Colin and Christy? No, I, th I think the only only thing I would add is that there, there absolutely is like the revenues that have a nexus, right? I mean, we've, we've struggled for years. I mean, the amount of value we've taken out of the ground and how little of that is actually wound up back in the ground um, through habitat. And obviously, you know, with a lot of groups like TRCP and Trout Unlimited's leadership, um, like looking at renewable energy, I mean, I think we can correct some of that. And there'll be a lot of revenue there in the years ahead. I and mean, we obviously have some tough, uh, exciting issues to, to navigate. But I also think this is one of those areas that we hold to a different standard than a lot of other types of public investments, right? Like when we're talking about education investments, we don't typically talk about like how we're going to tax, you know, buyers of books or buyers of, you know, pencils to try to fund education. We don't, we definitely don't have that conversation in the defense context. We very recently we haven't had in the infrastructure context, which is a bigger problem. And so like I'm all for user pay, you know, kind of public benefit. You know, kind of models, but I also think there's an equity piece that's been lost for many years. I mean, the fact that we have a $20 billion deficit because we've been unwilling to use general revenues for some of these activities. And like, I absolutely think they should be plussed up by additional, you know, user fees and, and different pieces, probably not in the depths of an economic depression and you know, kind of a global trade war. But, you know, I mean, I think we have to have these conversations, but there's been a systematic underinvestment in conservation and we're paying the price. Um, we're seeing that we're paying the price and, you know, these mega fires that are just raging out of control, partially because of climate change, partially because of poor management and, and health of our forests, right? Same thing with wetlands that have been de degraded that aren't providing the storm benefits. So, I mean, we kind of underinvest at our own peril. And I think it's going to take a diversification of revenues like we've all talked about to make sure we have the resources we need to both grow the outdoor economy and steward these land for future generations. Yeah, and I would say to, to echo Colin there, right? I, I do agree. I think conservation has gotten short shrift in, in sort of the budgeting and funding processes, but that's a reality. Like that's a reality we have to deal with that we've kind of always dealt with. And, and maybe there's success on that front to shift some of those proportions, but sometimes there's like a self-help program that you can put in place. And, um, and I think you, you enhance your standing. When I think about hunters and anglers and what they bring to the table, the license revenue is 1.6 billion a year in hunting and angling license fees that come get brought forward. LWCF is 900 million annually. So you've already, you know, almost doubled 
the amount of LWCF with the amount that hunters and anglers alone bring to the bring to the table. And I think it's a way to get Congress's attention. Like if you're bringing real money to the table, you might elevate your your status in terms of priority funding to have more of a match. And I know Senator, when Colin and I were on a panel together, Senator Manchin and Senator Murkowski were both very excited about this about this idea as a way to to supplement uh, conservation funding. Yeah, that, and that, that raises. Well, it, it, go it, ahead, it's Just one, not one last really quick thought, um, because I think Brian's right. Right, it's both and. We, they're, they're, I mean, the the size scale of the outdoor economy does require you know having investments that having kind of public investments making making huge a lot of sense. But at the end of that panel, where Brian and I were testifying, the very last question from Senator Manchin was, "What about the deficit? Right? What about our twenty two trillion dollars worth of debt that we have on the books?" And you know, the truth is that if you look at all twenty two trillion dollars, right, you look at the bailouts and the, and the stimulus packages, you look at the tax cuts and the wars, very little of that $22 trillion has anything to do with conservation. And the pieces that do actually go back, almost to back to kind of the economic recovery coming out of the depression um, and a little bit in the 2009 stimulus package. And so, you know, I just think, I just wanna make sure that as we're having these conversations, um, we don't allow ourselves to always play by a completely different set of rules. But Brian is absolutely right. The more money we're bringing to the table, the more seriously we're gonna be taken. Let me, um, we're running out of time here, but let me, uh, Rod Richardson uh, poses a, a question for, for the panel, and Rod is a participant today. Um, and he raises the question about the role of states, whether or not, uh, you know, how states should get involved with the management of, of national parks and public lands, whether or not they could be gifted. Some of these lands could be gifted back to states and local governments that want to, to, to take these lands back under, under local control. I know that can raise some, some eyebrows and create some controversy, but what, uh, what is the proper role of states in managing these lands? Anybody want to take that? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to start. <laughs> um, I'm guessing my, my, it might be a good, good, good conversation on this. Look, I mean, the, the history of, of lands being turned back to the states has led to privatization. Um, for the most part, if you look in Nevada, you look at even Colorado. I mean, a lot of the state lands that have been turned over to the states have been quickly sold when there's budget shortfalls. And I understand it, right? The states are incredible pressures. They can't, you know, print money. Um, they don't have the monetary policy to play with. Um, I, I like some of the models that are coming out of the Forest Service. We're seeing kind of shared stewardship and collaboration. Um, I like, I, I love the idea of investing heavily in our state lands um, and in doing more work. I think there's a lot of like stewardship contracting opportunities we're seeing. I think there's a lot of innovative work in the Forest Service that frankly could be more applied to like the Bureau of Land Management and some other places. I mean, the Federation's point of view, like I just want to make sure that I'm less concerned about ownership. I'm much more concerned about management. And I think we've, we've, we've so often fight on management because we have to. Like there's folks that would liquidate public lands like immediately and remove access for all of us. And at the same time, there's places where, you know, the management resources aren't there. And there's also some places where an easement and keeping land in private hands makes more sense if you get the access than the federal government having to own any, everything. It's one of the reasons why we were so supportive of the 40% and LWCF when it was kind of permanently reauthorized, making sure that money winds up with the states because the states have been raided over and over and over again. And frankly, a lot of times I want decision makers, I'm more on the ground picking which parcels are more, most important for recreation needs of their community. And that's a good, good balance. So um, yeah, I'm sorry to Mr. Richardson, but um, you know, I'd rather not have the states sell a bunch of all of that. <laughs> yeah, I would, I, I would say, look, I, I don't think necessarily transferring land to the states is the answer. It's, that's just moving the problem around. I mean, what we need is better, better management of our federal lands. But I do think the states can play a role in that, a key role uh, in that, um, in that, um, like, like Colin said, you've got shared stewardship responsibilities. Um, Pew Charitable Trust did a report last year that actually talked about like a road that goes through a national park. <clears throat> and one way perhaps to re reduce the deferred maintenance is you've got states on either side of a road that just sort of bisects, it's not the heart of the park, but that states could have some kind of role in actually paying for and maintaining that road and that road potentially uh, comes a state road. Or another thought is the federal government without ceding ownership can actually contract with states, you know, and create sort of a, a you know, some type of a, a contractual arrangement where um, they're sort of guideposts, you know, uh, guardrails on what can and can't be done in that land but that the states might be able to more effectively provide that service and the federal government could pay the state to, to, to do some of that management. So I do think there's, a, there's definitely a role for, for states here. States manage 95% of the fish and wildlife in America, and I think do a pretty darn good job of it. You know, we've got a little bit of endangered species. So I'm not gonna, I, I, I don't 
I don't sort of, there are some and nobody here on the panel who say, oh, states can't do it. States are just, they have the wrong incentives. But we, we allow them to manage our fish and wildlife. And I think they do an outstanding job uh, in managing fish and wildlife across America right now. So why not allow them some management of public lands? Christine, yeah, and I was, I was gonna throw out an example actually from Brian's former state from, from Florida where one of the most innovative opportunities I saw with regard to you know, a blended of LWCF funding and state funding and, and cooperative agreement opportunities was with Northern Everglades Headwaters Conservation Area, uh, one of the newest national wildlife refuges that was put together. Huge, amazing partnership with Fish and Wildlife Service, State of Florida, and a bunch of um, private landowners and organizations, um, Audubon Nature Conservancy, we had, uh, you know, National Wild Turkey Federation involved down there and looking for these opportunities for a blend of conservation easements on the private lands and fee title areas, which would be co-managed, um, the state um, fish and wildlife populations and those state fish and wildlife populations found on that new National Wildlife Refuge, those populations would be co-managed between the Fish and Wildlife Service and the state. And I, I think that was for in, you know, in my understanding, one of the first times we've seen a cooperative agreement with this co-management between the state and the feds on federal land. And it also opened up a whole new area for hunting and fishing in a state where very little of that, especially in that northern part of the state exists. You know, so we, it was sort of a win-win-win in multiple ways and LWCF funding used to, you know, for both the conservation easement and fee title acquisitions. We had Farm Bill funding coming in to do a lot of the conservation work um, on adjacent lands through NRCS funding. And then you have this overlay of this new innovative conservation agreement, cooperative agreement between the feds and the states for management. So it was a, it was a pretty cool opportunity, you know, very innovative and one I think we should explore more across all of these different, you know, uh, these different ownerships um, and, and different techniques that we can be using, whether it's Farm Bill, whether it's, you know, some of the existing authorities already at the federal and state levels. Really good points, Christy. We've got another question from one of the participants, uh, David, who asked, how much emphasis has been given to the economic development impacts of the act? Example, the Daniel Boone National Forest needs a lot of upgrades and maintenance before it can ever become a true tourist destination. It is located here in the poorest congressional district in the U.S., but it attracts very few tourists. What, what, uh, you know, what can, what, what are other considerations for, for those types of uh, development impacts? Any thoughts on that? Well, I would just, you know, I would, I would jump in to say, I, so I think uh, there's a big emphasis on, on the economic stimulus uh, component of this act. And I don't have the numbers. I'm not going to. I'm not going to suggest that it doesn't have economic stimulus. But I also think that at least, like on the Park Service side, they learned back in 2009 when the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was passed as a stimulus package. There was a rush to uh, fund projects that were quote shovel ready or ready to go. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it didn't hit the mark. That you know, you talk to superintendents and they said, you know, we spent a lot of money on things that probably weren't a high priority. They just mm -hmm. happened to be ready. And so I think there's got to be a blend here. I mean, I think there is stuff that could help economically and projects ready their priority. But I also think you need to look at that park endowment fund. I mean, that was something Perk had, had proposed back in the back in the 19 in that 1997 report to say, look, let's make sure we get the spending right, not just fast um, at the end of the day. Um, I think this is a I think this is legislation that stands alone. I don't think it needs I mean, maybe it needs the economic stimulus boost, but conservation at this time, with everything we're experiencing in this country as a healing agent, uh, is important. And and I'm for one, I'm happy that this is a standalone bill rather than something that's being rolled and sort of buried into a stimulus package. But I do think there's a blend, and and I think you know, ec good economics would tell you, don't just rush to spend it. You know, spend it on quality projects um, that are out there that are going to have the in the in the words of Cam Sholley, the the Yellowstone superintendent, I had a conversation with him this weekend about it. He's like, we got to make sure we we get the biggest bang for our buck uh, yeah. with this really good uh, fund that's being created. 
well stated. We'll take one more question. We have one more question from, from a participant. Uh, we actually have uh, one participant who's actually read the legislation. Um, Peggy asks in section J1, there is a piece about public cash donations to these efforts. Is this new? What are the implications of private influence on land management? Is that a concern under this piece of legislation? <laughs> Anyone want to well, weigh in on that? Our, our former uh, congressional, uh, you know, head of committee staff. So maybe. <laughs> did you draft that, Christy? <laughs> <laughs> no, I did not. You know, I, I mean, I would say there there are a number of statutes that do allow for for that. Um, it, you know, it tends to be. It it tends to be fairly controlled um, and you know it that those funds go into it into a special fund um it allows for some innovation with regard to working with foundations for example and you know working to to complement the existing funding that's in those accounts um i i, I mean i i'm not working there's so much other i i looked again through the legislation last night there are a lot of other controls in place to ensure that this funding's going out on the ground and in, in the way it needs to, you know, there's a there's a list that's submitted to Congress. Um, the appropriators also still have quite a bit of control to shift, um, you know, some of some of where the funding might be directed towards. So I, I think we've got these checks and balances in place that I'm I'm not worried about that. And again, I've I've never seen with that language and statute that we've had a problem, um, and, and I expect that. The, the revenues that are going into this account in comparison to some of those private donations will be will be in contrast very different um and again if we see a huge donation you know like some of what happened with regard to private donations that went to fix like the washington monument after we had the earthquake in dc there was a lot of checks and balances and a lot of public uh -huh. transparency over those funds um, and so there was a, a private infusion of funding that got the project done, but again, just a, a tremendous amount of transparency that went into that process. Yeah, transparency look, should, is definitely key. We should tap the passion for our national parks. I mean, Rubenstein's contributions to help with uh, historic, you know, documents like the Declaration of Independence and Constitution and Lincoln Memorial and things like that. I mean, th there are people that want, that they feel very proud about the lands that we have right now. And some of these places that perhaps they visited when they were children, and um, so I, you know, I look at the at the willingness of of private folks, be they foundations or corporations or individuals. Every park has its has its friends organization. I mean, it's happening right now. I mean, donations to Yellowstone. You can't write a check to Yellowstone. You got to write a check to Yellowstone forever, um, and then that money will go back into the park in in uh, cooperation with the superintendent there. So. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's a good I think it's a good thing. I mean, again, we were talking about diverse revenue streams and private uh, private uh, entities stepping forward to help is a is really important. I think. Well, that's I think that's a, a great positive note to, to end this webinar on. So I want to thank all three of you for your leadership, your expertise, and and sharing that with the rest of us today. So. Thank you, um, hey, Brent, Colin. Before and, we, hey, before yes. we let folks go, though, hey, so this is not a done deal. <laughs> like, sorry, this is the advocacy. <laughs> the advocacy, the advocacy Fair right point. Um, like, you know, we need your help. So if you've been inspired by this at all, if you, you know, you care about our public lands, outdoor recreation, you know, making sure there's close to home recreation, um, we need your help. This is going to be incredibly important, but we're in a sprint right now. So if you know a senator, if you have a willingness to call his office or her office, um, you know, get on the phone, send an email, get on social media, um, anything you can do can help right now. And, you know, we're, we're in this, we're, we're, at, we're, on, we're inside the red zone, right? We're probably on the five, six yard line right now, but we gotta get in, into the end zone. And it's gonna take all of us doing our part. So just appreciate yeah, everyone listening point. today, but take one action after you get off this call. Yeah, and I can't, point. Look, I, I, we're, we can't lobby, but I will say, I will say this. <laughs> Americans right now are planning their summer vacations to their national parks. And with everything that's been going on with the pandemic and, and um, you know, issues with, with the tensions that we're experiencing now, you know, getting to your park is a sense of traveling back to normal for a lot of these families. We're seeing it out here at the gates of Yellowstone. Um, it's a good time for people to be turning to the outdoors for physical and mental health. And uh, I was reminded uh, with Christy, you know, Theodore Roosevelt uh, tragically had his uh, wife and mother both pass away 
on the same day, February 14th, mm -hmm. 1884. And where did he go to recover from that? Uh, that tragedy was the Badlands of North Dakota. He escaped there. Uh, that, that area that he went to is now named after him. It's Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And so there's great examples of history of, of the great outdoors helping us all. And so that's, that's why, why now, you know, why during this time with everything going on is this important? That, that to me is why. That's a really, really good point, Brian. So, well, thanks again, Christy, Colin, Brian, for your, your time today and your expertise. And uh, let's, let's push this ball across the, uh, the one yard line into the end zone. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, Thank you.